Bible, and you'd open them, please, to 1 Chronicles chapter 15. I know I've preached on this subject matter in the past uh, couple of years, but tonight we're going to look at a completely different aspect of the entire scenario, the entire story. 1 Chronicles 15, beginning at verse 25. And we're just going to read five verses through verse 29, standing in honor of the reading of God's Word. I read tonight from the King James text, So David and the elders of Israel and the captains over thousands went to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the house of Obadiah with joy. And it came to pass when God helped the Levites that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord that they offered seven bullocks and seven rams. And David was clothed with a robe of fine linen, and all the Levites that bear the ark, and the singers, and Chenaniah, the master of the song with the singers, David also had upon him an ephod of linen. Thus all Israel brought up the ark of the covenant of the Lord, with shouting and with the sound of the cornet and with trumpets and with cymbals, making a noise with psalteries and harps. And it came to pass as the ark of the covenant of the Lord came to the city of David that Michael, the daughter of Saul, looking out a window, saw King David dancing and playing. And she despised him in her heart. How do you like that? I want to look tonight at the heart of the matter, at the heart of the matter. Master, we thank you, God, tonight for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your presence. We ask God, in spite of a slight chill in the air tonight, we ask, Lord, that you'd help us to deliver your word in such a way that it might be helpful to somebody. God, let somebody that hears this word be encouraged. Let somebody be lifted up. Let somebody tonight, Lord, find a new place in you that they've never before known. Jesus, let your anointing flow like water over a rock. And, Master, saturate us this hour with your presence as we seek to expound some simple truths for the benefit of God's people. For we ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be interested. Uh, you may be seated tonight. Boy, I'm just batting a thousand, aren't I? You may be interested. I'm looking at my notes and the words there, and I'm saying it before I... <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> Isn't it interesting how that God's people can find cause to rejoice and there's always somebody, there's always somebody that's going to criticize. There's always somebody that's going to look and find a reason to find fault and to criticize. No matter how hard you try to do the right thing and to do a good thing, Somebody always is going to look your way and find fault with what you're doing. You know what I'm talking about? Amen. And without fail, it's always those that are closest to you. David was bringing in the Ark of the Covenant back into the house of Israel. He was bringing it back to its place of honor where it belonged. It was time for great rejoicing in Israel. It was time for great rejoicing in the city of David. And yet his wife, Michal, nah, she didn't see any reason to get all that excited about it. She didn't see where it was anything to get all that thrilled about. You know, you go to church and see somebody go up for prayer, and they get happy, and you sit there and think, or you know somebody that sits there and thinks, well, I don't know why they got to act like that just because they didn't pray for them. Well, who cares? It's them. Let them get their blessing. If you don't want one, then for God's sake, shut up. Don't get yours, but don't hinder them from getting theirs. But the thing I want to look at tonight is, and I'm going to try and do this quickly. I only have one page of notes, so it shouldn't take me too long. I want to look at the heart of the matter because I want to point out to you tonight that the Word of God has painstakingly made the specific effort to point out what Mikkel had going on in her heart. How do you like that? Now, you've got to remember, this book's been around a long time. A lot of people have read that story. 
one, a lot of people have read about that woman. And many people, because God deemed it necessary and important, many people have read and understood what was going on inside of her. You're following me now. Isn't it interesting that God is watching what's going on on the inside? Amen. Sometimes people think they can pull the wool over God's eyes and he won't catch it. He won't understand. He won't see. Honey, God sees what's going on on the inside. He saw David dancing on the outside, but he saw Michal despising on the inside. Amen. And he made certain that mention was made of it in the Word of God. And if you read further in the story, you'll find that Michal was actually caused to become barren. And she never bare David any children because of her heart. Do you hear me now? Because of what was going on in her heart. There are so many people come into churches and they cannot understand why bad things are happening in their lives when they're trying to live a good life externally as a believer and as a Christian and as a saint, and yet things aren't going right in their lives and they question why. And it's not because God has cursed you. It's not because God's against you. It's because something is not right at the heart of the matter. Amen. Somewhere along the line, you're looking at someone else with judgment. You're looking at someone else with criticism. See, Juan, I've got good news tonight. God does not hold you and I responsible for what somebody else thinks about us. They may not like us being in church tonight. They may not like us shouting tonight. They may not like us singing the songs of Zion tonight. It doesn't matter if they like it or they don't like it. They can love it. Glory to God. Because God is looking at your heart and my heart. And that's what's important to God. And if in their heart they're despising us, that's their business. But don't, don't be surprised. If things aren't born into your life which are important, don't be surprised if things aren't born into your life which you need. Don't be surprised if blessings don't come your way. Not you and I, but I'm talking about that one that's looking and despising in their heart. Because God responds to us according to what's going on in our hearts. God responded to Michal according to what was going on in her heart. She might have acted all nice and pretty with David. She might have spoken to him real kind and sweet. But in her heart, she still was a sourpuss. See, we think because this is what bothers me. I I hear Christian people say this all the time. Well, you know, yeah, I love him because the Bible says I'm supposed to. Mm, Do you really? I don't think you do. (laughs) I think you're saying you love them because the Bible says you're supposed to. And you think in the process of saying it, you're convincing God that you're doing it. Hello now. My Lord, have mercy. You can't stand there and tell me that while somebody's standing here telling me, well, I love him, even, you know, he did me wrong, and I don't like what he did, and blah, 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 but I love him because the Bible says that I'm supposed to. Who are you trying to convince, me or God? Because, sweetie, I've got news for you. If God can see what was going on in Mikkel's heart, God can see what's going on in yours. And if you think you're going to sit there and have a heart and a spirit that's saying, I hate that little sucker with everything in my being. Boy, I wish he'd go to another church because I really can't stand that boy. And You know what I'm saying? You think you're going to have that going on on the inside, and God isn't seeing, and God isn't understanding. You are so wrong, it's not even funny. Amen. One, God doesn't hold us responsible for what other people think about us, but let me tell you, God does hold us responsible for what we think about other people. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. That's why people say to me, I've been in affirming ministry for 13 years, and I've had a number of transgendered and transsexual people in my church. And I've had people say to me, including church members, well, I feel uncomfortable around that person. You know, I mean, 
looks like a big old bulldog in a dress. I mean, just not real pretty and doesn't look good. And when we go out in public, you know, it just, it, well, I, I just feel uncomfortable. And I have to respond by saying, you know what? If I believe God can accept me, ugly as I am, maybe on the inside, maybe not on the outside. Of course, I'm not so hot on the outside either. But I mean, as ugly as I am on the inside, if God can take me, then God can take them. And if God can take them, honey, I'm going to tell you, I can embrace them and I can love them and don't anybody dare say a word against them because to speak against them is to speak against me. We're one body. We're one group of folks that believe the same thing. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. And I've got news for you. Don't come against one of my transgendered or transsexual friends because they'll be hell to pay. I've told you all how that at one restaurant where we used to go fellowship after church, this one waitress one time was making a comment about Theodora, one of our transsexual members. And I heard it. And I went to the manager, and you all know I can get mad. And when I get mad, I'm like a volcano. You can see I'm mad as all murder. But I'm trying to keep it in, you know, but I come across pretty mad. And I went to that man, and I said, I'm going to tell you something. We've been coming here for months and giving you our money. We've been coming here for months and giving you our business. I said, that person is a member of my church. You may not love her, but I do. That person is a part of my family. I said, you may not care about her, but I do. I said, don't you or anybody in this establishment ever say a word again about that woman, because if you do, we'll take our business somewhere else. Amen. You know why, Tommy? Because that's my heart. I'm not talking trash. I'm not saying something I don't feel. Do you understand what I'm saying? Amen. You know when somebody is speaking from the heart and when they're just saying something to be saying something. You know, it's funny. We went and saw recently at uh, Eastfield College this man who has developed something of a science of reading faces. And he claims that life experiences and just personality aspects of a person tend to reveal themselves in their faces. And as you get older, of course, your face changes. And he said, well, it, it, it changes according to these factors. And I found it interesting because as he was speaking, I sat there and I thought to myself, I wonder if there wouldn't be some sort of a biblical precedent for face reading. I wonder if the Bible doesn't say something that would kind of make you wonder if looking into a person's face and being able to see certain things in their face. I wonder if there isn't a precedent in Scripture. See, I always tend to think that way, you know. Well, let me read something to you. <laughs> this, you might find this a little bit interesting. In Proverbs 23 and 7, the Lord said, Eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye. Huh. Well, that's funny because the face reader was talking about a certain trait in people who are up to no good, and he talked about the fact that without fail, their eyelid on top tends to come down over their eye and cut their pupil right about in half. He said, if you look at these, and he showed us pictures of terrorists who were involved in 9-11 and murderers and men who had done horrible things and every one of them held their eyes just exactly that same way and the word of the Lord says eat not the bread of him that hath an evil eye neither desire thou his dainty meat for as he thinketh in his heart so is he eat and drink saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. You see, the truth of the, re the reality of this thing today, one, is 
It's what's going on. It's going what? Let me say this again. It's what's going on in your heart that defines you today, not what you say. You know the old saying, "Talk is cheap." Well, it is. Anybody can say anything to anyone. Juan, as you get older, I'm sure you're going to have a lot of romantic encounters where somebody's going to smooth talk you and bamboozle you and tell you all kinds of sweetnesses and all kinds of niceties because they want to get something out of you or they want to get close to you. But I want to warn you now, everything comes out of people's mouths does not originate in their heart. And you've got to be careful. And you've got to be mindful. I've learned. I was kind of naive when I first came out. I really was. I was very naive. I never had dated a whole lot. So I didn't really know much about dating, you know. Somebody spent a little time with me and tell me I was the greatest person they ever met. And, oh, I was just so sweet and I was so wonderful. And, and of course, I believed them. I just thought I was, you know. I said, yes, sir, I am, bless God, Hallelujah. You know, I just thought I was the greatest thing since sliced bread because they, they had my self-esteem just climbing the walls, you know. They had me feeling so good about myself. Well, then, you know, and I'm going to say this as nicely as I can, one romantic encounter later and they were out the door like a bullet. All of a sudden, I wasn't nice enough to want to be around for any length of time. I wasn't nice enough to want to have a relationship with, even though that's what I was looking for. You see what I'm saying? So you got to be careful. Because what comes out of people's mouths, Proverbs tells us, is not what is genuinely going on with them all the time. It's hard to get someone who speaks their heart. Amen. It's very hard to find someone who speaks their heart. I didn't say speaks their mind. Amen. I said who speaks their heart. You know how hard it is to get somebody to open up and tell you and share with you and help you understand them and understand why maybe they do things the way they do things or understand why maybe, you know, they have this phobia or why they have this fear or why they have this uh, apprehension or whatever the case might be. Because, see, they're not talking their mind. They're talking their heart. They're letting you in to a very vulnerable place. They're letting you in to a very fearful, scary place. Talk about soft and mushy. Those things in there are very vulnerable. And it'd be very easy for somebody. Haven't you ever had told somebody something really important and private and confidential and then had them just turn around and at some point open their big fat trap and totally leave you blasted? I remember times as a kid, and my mother's going to love this one. But it's the only example I can think of. I remember times as a kid I said things to my mother that I felt about my dad. And I'd say, Mother, I, I tell you, I just think I can't help but believe the man doesn't so, this and that. And I meant what I was saying. I wasn't talking from my head. I was talking from my heart. That's genuinely what I felt. It wasn't good to have to say it because I was saying that I believe my father was a whoremonger is what it amounted to. And then my mother opened her big mouth and said to my dad, well, you know what CJ said? He said, doesn't so. And I'm standing there going, because mm -hmm. my dad wasn't my first fan to start with, okay? He wasn't my best friend. And the minute them words come off her lips, I knew, oh, God. I'm going to be on his hit list for the rest of my life because, you know, that's not what he needs to hear. But you see, this is what happens. This is why people tend to guard their heart. This is why people, what they're, what's going on deep inside them, you'll never know because they can't afford to let that information out. They can't afford to share that. They can't afford to make themselves vulnerable and let you have access to that. You know, there's nothing more hurtful than somebody coming across, and when they get mad and they get angry, and all of a sudden they decide they're going to say something nasty to you based on something you've shared with them. Am I right? That's hurtful. Because here you've shared your heart, you've opened your heart and shared something from the heart, 
and then they turn around and use that very information to hurt you with it. Now, you know, let's say I'm going to use a fictitious example. Let's say that you were molested as a child and you shared that with your husband, your wife, your partner, whatever the case might be. And then at some point you have an argument and they come back and they say something to the effect of, well, just because your father molested you or just because such and so. And it's like, no, 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 that information isn't meant for use in this context. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That information, oh no, that, that's not supposed to be used in this kind of a context. You're not supposed to use that against me as a, as a, as a weapon. You're not supposed to do that. But it's so hard to get people to open their heart and share their heart. But what I want us to understand tonight is God sees the heart. Not one time. You may never be able to open your heart one and say a lot of what's on your mind. But God has already seen it. And you know why I'm saying this tonight? I'm saying this tonight because for years and years I sat in churches, Pentecostal churches, and nobody help me to understand this. I sat in those churches and I wrestled with issues and I wrestled with things and I felt like God wanted nothing to do with me and I was unclean, I was unholy, I was profane, I was the most disgusting thing on God's great planet and yet nobody, nobody ever said to me, Chuck, regardless of what goes on outside of your body, God knows what's going on. He understands what's going on. He is in full and complete control, and he understands every aspect of what's happening in your heart and in your mind. And you don't have to be afraid to open up and let God know. You don't have to be afraid to open up and let God in. Because, sweetheart, i got news for you. You don't have enough power to keep him out. Amen. You don't have enough strength to keep him out. So you might as well just open up and let him see and be honest. This is what I keep trying to explain to people in our community. The best thing you can do with God is to live honestly before him. David the psalmist said, My sin I have not hid from thee. Of course you didn't, David. You couldn't if you wanted to. But David knew better than to even try. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden put on their little fig leaves and tried to hide what they could. But you see, David knew better. He said, Honey, there ain't a fig leaf that's big enough to hide my sin. I might as well just be honest with God. If you look at the scriptures and you look at the heroes of the Bible, it is amazing to me how misconstrued and misunderstood and misrepresented this is. But if you look at the great heroes of the Bible, there is not a one of them that was not very human. There was not a one of them that was not very faulty. There was not a one of them that was not very weak. There was not a one of them that was not very sinful. And yet, what does God look at? He said, David, David's a man after my own heart. <laughs> he says, I look at his heart, and you know what I see? I see a heart that beats for me the same way mine beats for him. When I see David, that's what I see. When I see David, I see a man who could look at a woman and get so horny that he had to kill somebody to get her. Is it okay that I said that? That's what I see when I see David. I see somebody who just, when he saw something he wanted, he'd do whatever he had to do to get it. David was a ruthless son of a gun. He was a tough man. A lot of people point to King Solomon, and they say, well, you know, God came to Solomon and said, anything you want, I'll give you. And Solomon, all he asked for was wisdom to judge God's people well, to, to rule God's people well. That's all he asked for. And the Bible said God promised to give him wisdom, but not just wisdom, but he promised to give him uh, the riches and all the uh, extras that he didn't ask for. You know, sometimes if we learned to ask for the right things, God would give us the extras. 
Come on now. If we quit asking for the extras and start asking, Lord, I need wisdom. Lord, help me to know when to shut my mouth. Now help me to know when to say the right thing. Help me to know when not to say anything. And then from there, God says, aha, now you're on the right track. Now I can give you the wealth. Now I can give you the riches. Now I can give you a house. Now I can give you a car. Now I can give you the money. But without the wisdom, those things would be worthless to you anyway. So you see, the problem is with old Solomon. Have you ever looked at the reign of King Solomon? Do you know what old Solomon did the very second that he came into power? Started killing people. We talk about Saddam Hussein and how Saddam Hussein, well, he went out and just started killing people that opposed him. So did Solomon. He wiped out all his enemies, everybody that opposed him, everybody that was standing in opposition to him. Solomon wiped them out within days of putting on the crown. Isn't it interesting? One of our great heroes of the Bible. But you know what, Tommy? No matter what we do in this thing we call a body, God is focused on what's going on in our heart. And he knew Solomon was trying to make sure that his, his uh, reign was secure. He was trying to make sure that the kingdom was secure. He wasn't out there just murdering people to be murdering people. He didn't just look at somebody and say, no, you're ugly, I don't like you, kill them. He didn't, like old Saddam, you know, he didn't just have people that uh, <clears throat> he decided, well, I don't like that group over there, so just wipe out that group. He didn't do that. But what he did still constituted murder. And it was still wrong. But in spite of that, God still looked at Solomon's heart because what was Solomon given the privilege and the right to do to build God's temple? David wasn't even afforded that privilege. A man after God's own heart wasn't even afforded that privilege. But Solomon was afforded that privilege. So you see, it's what's at the heart of the matter that matters to God. It's not what you say. It's not so much what you do. But you know what? If you think about it, if your heart's right, then your conduct will be right. This is why I tell people, they say, well, what do you preach in your church? Do you preach against this? Do you preach against that? I said, no. I try to preach a message <clears throat> that will help people's hearts to get in alignment with God's heart. Because if you can get people lined up with God, then you start doing right. If you can get people lined up with God, you start acting right. If you can get people lined up with God, then you start talking right and walking right and doing right. Amen. You can't be lined up with God and do all the wrong things because it just doesn't work that way. Draw nigh unto God, he'll draw nigh unto you. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. The closer you draw to God's heart, then the more like him you become. The more like him you become, the less the devil wants to keep company with you. Hello now. Amen. 1 Samuel 16 and 7 tells us, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. One, so many people want to look today, and they look at GLBT people, and all they can see, which cracks me up, is what we do in our bedrooms, which is none of their business from the get-go. But that's all they want to see. And, I, and they want to judge, and they want to criticize based on that. And I'm sitting here saying, excuse me, hello, somebody. God looks on the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. Man sees what we do. God sees why we do it. Hello now. Uh, excuse me, folks. Doesn't anybody seem to get this message? You're looking at one thing. God's looking at another. When the church and God are looking in two different directions, something's wrong. Hello now. Something is wrong when God's church is looking one way and, and God is looking the other. My Lord, have mercy. Listen to 1 John 3, 18 through 20. My little children, let us love not 
in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. He said this is how we secure our position before God. This is how we get our hearts lined up before God so that we can stand with assurance like the old song said, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. He said, this is how you're able to nail that assurance down and to know that you know that you know that you know that you know that you're saved. How? He said, for if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. You know, there are some times that we translate things in our heart concerning ourselves harder and harsher than God does. How do you like that? Did you hear that? If our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Listen to this. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. If you can walk and live, and in your heart you know you're okay. See, it don't matter what Sister Jones over there at First UPC thinks. It don't matter what Brother Smith over at First Assembly of God thinks. It doesn't matter what old Macau thinks. What matters is if you can walk and have peace of heart and know, I'm doing the best I can. God knows I'm doing the best I can. I'm being everything I can, and God knows I'm being everything I can. I'm not trying to hide nothing from him. I'm walking honestly before him, and I'm doing everything in my power to live for him till Jesus comes. Come on now. The Bible said, if you can do that, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. My Lord, have mercy. See how easy it is? That's why Peter said, in one place, he's preaching in the book of Acts, and he said, he said, I'll tell you what, I've come to the conclusion that in every nation, I don't care where you come from, I don't care what background you come from, everybody that fears God, everybody has a desire to do right, is accepted by Him. If you fear God, if you love God, if you want to do the right thing, then God will accept you, period, case closed, end of the story, go home preacher. Amen. And know at that point in time that you have the ability to ask God for what you need and God will say yes. And he'll answer your prayer because you're doing all you can do to keep his commandments and to walk and to do those things that are pleasing in his sight. In his sight. Where is his sight focused? On the heart. So that's not talking about he's focusing on what you're doing. He's talking about why you're doing it. Do you know there are so many times that people come to me outside of racetrack and all, and they're begging money. You know, a lot of people come. Of course, in today's world, a lot of folks are doing this, and they're trying to come up with drug money and alcohol money, and you know. And so many times I have to say, sorry, can't help you. And sometimes I have to do it kind of harsh to turn them away because otherwise they'll just really hound you. You know how that works. And do you know inside my heart, the Spear family sing a song, Look Me in the Heart. If you could look in my heart at that moment, you'd see it breaking. Because I hate to say no to anybody that I think might possibly be hungry. But you know what? If they were and I have the money, the Spirit of the Lord will tell me. And I And he will. And I will give in that instance because I know I can help somebody eat. But you know what? My heart, Mom, is a giving heart. I love to give. 
I love to give. If I could give to every single soul that ever come up to me and said, can you help me? If I had a million dollars in the bank, I'd be happy to give to everybody that came because I have a heart to give, and God sees that. So you know what, Tomney? If I don't have the wherewithal to give and to give and to give and to give so that God can see me do the given, that's okay because God sees the heart that wants to give. You follow me today? Amen. I'll tell you, I think there are a lot of young people out there who have slept around till they just about slept themselves to death. It's not because they love sex. All these ignorant preachers that get up, these, these uh, conservative right-wing lunatic preachers, get up and say, well, we can't give out condoms in the school because that would be encouraging the kids to have sex, and we don't want to encourage the kids to have sex. I've got news for you, stupid. These kids aren't looking for sex. They're looking for love. They're looking for affection. Half the time they're not getting it at home. And they think that they're going to find something special and something greater and something deeper in an intimate physical relationship with another human being. That's what they're looking for. So while you're sitting here condemning them because you think all they want is the physical pleasure out of the thing. That may be true for the boys. But the girls and the boys who think like girls tend to tend to be more interested in the emotional, tend to be more interested in the intimacy, tend to be more interested in the contact. I can sleep and cuddle all night. I just love to sleep and cuddle. Oh, yummy, yummy. Yeah, okay, fine. Bring on the... Yeah, I'm a man. Thank you very much. But you, see, but you see, we make a mistake because they're so busy looking at the action that nobody is looking at the heart. Nobody's trying to understand what's going on at the heart of the matter. If they would address these situations from the standpoint of the heart of the matter, we could resolve a lot of teenage pregnancies. We could stop a lot of uh, unwed mothers. We could change the situation for a lot of young people and ha help them to have better, happier, healthier, more productive lives. But instead, we're trying to address them and approach them from the vantage point of actions, conduct, behavior. I love that phrase, behavior modification. You know what you need to, to change people's behavior? That's it. You need a change of heart. The minute somebody's heart is changed, you'll be shocked at all the other things that will change on the outside. We used to sing the old song, Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Amen. Because when you let the Lord come in, when you let the Lord become a major part of what's going on in your life, all of a sudden, how you do things and where you do things and why you do things changes. I've thought about it over the years. I've made some real good money in my day over the years. I've worked selling cars, and I've made real good money. And I thought about it, and I said, you know what? I never one time bought a flask of whiskey. I never one time bought a bottle of uh, whatever. <laughs> I don't even know what to say because I don't buy this stuff. I've never one time wasted my money on a pack of cigarettes. I've never put money down on a table in a whorehouse. I've never one time paid for a hooker more in my life than most people will ever have. You know why? Because I lived a good, clean, decent life. Amen. You live for the Lord, it's funny. Nobody had to tell me, don't hire a hooker. I didn't have a desire to. Nobody had to tell me, don't drink yourself bloody drunk. I didn't have a desire to. Nobody had to tell me, don't pick up cigarettes. I didn't have a desire to. When you've got the Lord working on the inside, what goes on on the outside automatically is affected by what's going on on the inside. Amen. I want you to know today, I'm going to close with this thought. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 27 and 28, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, 
that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already where? In his heart. You holy roller, high-haired queen, you. You can sit there in church and think you look righteous and godly and holy all you want to. And the whole time you're looking across the church at the pianist fella and listening after him and wishing that he was your husband instead of her husband. And I've got news for you. God is looking at the heart of the matter. God sees what's going on inside of you. And as far as God's concerned, you've already been to bed with that fella. My Lord, have mercy. Who am I saying it tonight or what? Now, I want to clarify in closing, if we have a murderous thought, that does not make you a murderer. A lot of people, this, this scripture kind of haunts them. It's like, well, does that mean if I, if I think to murder somebody that, that God looks at my heart and I've already murdered them? In my, in my heart, I've murdered them? No. If we have a murderous thought, that does not make us a murderer. But when your thought process is, automatically turn to murder you hear me now we have become a murderer when our heart becomes such that the minute we look I, I was just seeing on TV the other day about a, a man who had murdered several women something wrong with this man because he would get around a woman. He, he wouldn't even be dating her or anything. He'd, he'd go to do a job at her house. And after being around her for a certain time, all of a sudden, he'd turn to violence and he'd have to kill her. Here he went there to make money. But all of a sudden, there was something in him. There was something in his heart that was so murderous that he couldn't even stand to be around a woman for very long except that it turned immediately to murder then you've got people who they can't be around women very long before it turns to sex. You know what I'm saying? You've got people who there is a predisposition to a certain thing. The Lord said in this particular passage, if you look upon a woman to lust after her. He didn't say if you look upon a woman and lust after her. He said if your intent in looking is to lust. So right, so the intent pre-exists. The intent pre-exists. And the Lord says, if that precondition exists in your heart, God sees it. And then when you act upon it, not even by stepping out of your body in the least, you don't even have to reach out your arm to touch her. All you got to do is look at her. And you're wanting to lust because you're a lustful dog that's got all that in your heart. And you look at her and immediately you're picturing things and putting things together. The Lord says, then God's looking and he says, aha, look at this one over here, committing adultery. Amen. Notice he said adultery and not quote unquote fornication. Because so many will tell you fornication is is premarital sex. Pre fornication is not premarital sex. That is not how you define fornication. But the Lord said, if a man looks upon a woman to lust after, he's already committed adultery. He's assuming the man he's speaking of is married. Says, and he's already committed adultery in his heart. And like I've said all night tonight, where is God looking? He's looking at the heart. So what's important for us to maintain tonight we, we need to maintain an attitude like David in the Old Testament Psalms who said, Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. We need to pray in desire of God that he'd help us to keep our heart in alignment. You know, the enemy will tempt you sometimes. The enemy will come against your mind. He works that way. That's why I think so many people have gone overboard believing that, well, I'm a murderer because I, I dreamed of killing my father or I thought about killing my father who abused me and who did this and who did that. Well, honey, that doesn't make you a murderer. Every time you look at him, do you look at him with the, with the thought in your mind of the old man, if I had a knife, I'd stab it in your back right this second. Every time you look at him, does that intent, does that murderous intent pre-exist? No then you're not a murderer, darling. 
you're somebody that's been tempted with murder. If you have looked upon someone and in the process of looking at them you've been very attracted and interested in them and what have you and you've daydreamed and wandered in your mind a little bit and they're married. Ooh. Have you committed adultery? No, you haven't committed adultery. You've been tempted. But you didn't act upon it and therefore there was no adultery committed. But for that one who has a pre condition in their heart towards certain things so that every time